Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview Goku Mohandas. There are three aspects, three taglines on Goku's personal profile: AI research, healthcare, and education. We talk about all the of these three in this entire interview. We start by talking about Goku's journey into research, how he got interested into machine learning. He shares many amazing advices for future aspiring researchers. followed by healthcare and machine learning we share many interesting thoughts there followed by education goku has recently started made with machine learning.com his latest contribution to education machine learning education i would highly recommend that please even if you don't end up watching this complete interview pause this right now go to the website sign up on the website scroll through it you really like it it's it's become one of my favorite go to websites for staying on top of the machine learning content that the community keeps overflowing with made with ml is a platform for discovering projects organizing projects and building projects sharing them with the community we really dive deep into what the platform is the philosophy behind it and the future of it and many up and coming features most of these would have been integrated by the time this interview goes out so um, please do sign up if you get a chance i really enjoyed talking with goku all of the interaction on all of the topics had really interesting golden nuggets if i may so i'm really excited to be releasing this interview without further ado Here's the conversation. Please enjoy the show. Hi everyone. I have the someone on the show who's been in AI research, healthcare, and also education. Now we'll be talking about all of these things. But Gogu, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me Sanyam and thanks for doing this during all the covid I think people are looking for content uh and you you haven't stopped so thank you for continuing to put these out and I've been a big fan of the show since I guess uh, more than 6 months ago so uh, just fantastic content and uh look forward to this conversation Th- Thanks for the kind words uh, chat time is completely remote since the beginning so this business so to speak wasn't affected but I really yeah. wanted to have you on the show Absolutely So I want I'll probably start by a background because uh, it follows a really nice chronological order uh, maybe you can start with how did you get interested in machine learning first because I believe you started your bachelor's right around the time when uh, the AlexNet boom had happened how did you get interested in machine learning at that point Yeah so uh, actually funny story uh, so I went to Johns Hopkins which is primarily known for health and biomedical engineering uh, I was there I started in 2012 uh, which is when AlexNet came out and i actually didn't learn about alexnet until 2 years later i feel it was such a it was such a health bubble uh at you know a, a university where computer science wasn't the, the priority uh now it's changed but completely unaware of it so i guess uh my undergrad was fully focused on wet lab uh biomedical engineering and, and chemical engineering and when i look back now at the things that i did uh there were so many places ml could have been injected you know uh so many like reasonable places that ml could have been used to sort of help out here and there uh, hours of wet lab research could have been uh, optimized for sure <laughs> but um yeah uh, actually not even alex said i don't think i learned about python until the uh, towards the end of my undergrad actually and it's been, i think this is still the case a lot of uh, traditional whether it's a liberal arts school or hardcore science they still stick with matlab 
Um, and then you see a lot of universities still using R as well. Um, and then when, when a lot of these students go into industry, uh, they kind of struggle because, you know, industry is all Python uh, uh, for experimentation and, and then uh, different frameworks for uh, production. So there's a big disconnect there in terms of what's taught in schools. It's a little bit dated, but luckily there are a lot of resources, right? So um, the research that I do do at Hopkins, uh, it was mostly around synthesized uh, nanoparticles for targeted drug delivery. And the parts that I think ML could have been used, we'd spent hours sort of deciding how do you compose the right materials for for these nanomaterials so that you know from ingestion to breaking down in the body and then eventually leaving the body it, it all needs to follow a certain pattern depending on the drug that you're delivering so instead of like manually experimenting we have you know hours and hours thousands of hours worth of experimentation take all those different compositions you know composition of what materials you made and then instead of testing more you could have actually simulated uh different different outcomes uh, so that would that would have been very cool but I actually did get into machine learning towards the very end uh, and just and programming in, in general because, uh, you know, it was when AlexNet, I think, blew up the research side of things, right? A lot of researchers came in. Yeah. But then people in industry really started to come in when the framework started coming out. So uh, Theano was a big one. And then when TensorFlow, uh, you know, 0 0.1 came out, uh, I think it was end of 2015. 2015, right? yes. Yeah. So right around that time, people were like, oh. You know, I don't have to code. AlexNet, I think, was originally released in CUDA and C++, right? So when people said, oh, I don't have to code in that, uh, I, you know, I don't have to worry about pointers and stuff. I can come in and use something like TensorFlow. Um, I think that's, that's when I started to hear about it, uh, more on the industry side uh, of things. So uh, I started playing around with it then. Um, so that background was in Hopkins in the medicine side. But then I did uh, my master's at Georgia Tech. So that's more on the machine learning analytics uh, and a few computer science courses as well. So uh, I think it was a good transition. So JHU was uh, health and then GT was health with ML. So it was good that I got the background uh, in the industry because that allowed me to work on the right problems, right? So it's whatever task you're solving in, uh, I think you should think of ML as a, as a tool, not an industry on, on its own, Absolutely. right? So, Right. So absolutely. You should, you should try to understand what problem you're trying to focus on, how it's being done right now, good or bad. Uh, and then ask yourself if ML is the right thing to apply to the space. So I think I was kind of lucky to start with that trajectory instead of the other way around. Um, I, I actually recommend a lot of, to a lot of people now, uh, when you go to school, it's, a, it's good to major in computer science, uh, but try to major in something else as well, or you can completely major in something else because it's so simple and easy to learn computer science on the side now, right? You don't need to make that your main focus. Um, thanks to all the free resources out there. So, uh, yeah, so I think Georgia Tech was when I really started to get into uh, machine learning research. Uh, so this is around 2015 time. And I was primarily focused on uh, NLP combined with the healthcare space. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, embeddings uh, were already out at this time and people were starting to use you know, you have some text, embed it, and then try to use it for some uh, outcome task, right? Whether it's classification, generation, whatever it is. And when I say NLP with health, a lot of people th immediately think about, okay, so you have some clinical notes that you're trying to embed and you're trying to classify something, right? Is the patient going yeah. to uh, get something? Or, uh, and that happens maybe uh, zero to 5% of the time because, <laughs> you know, that's not how doctors or clinicians want to use uh, the data that they have. First of all, they're not going to trust that uh, because yeah. you just, you know, you're, you're putting it into some model that they have no idea about. But um, it's more representation, not just about the words, but of the actual patient themselves, right? So let's say you're a patient and you have all, you have all this multimodal data, right? You have clinical notes, you have time series, maybe from the actual hospital, uh, or maybe you have like a smart device or something. Um, you have all these uh, codes. Whenever you go to the hospital, they give you medical codes that are indicative of the different medications you were given, symptoms, everything. Um, and it's mostly made for insurance purposes, but it's really good for us because we can, we get, it's already codified, right? So we can start using that information. So not just words, we try to represent everything about the patient and code all of that and then use that to not necessarily predict something, but sort of suggest to the physicians that, hey, these are potential symptoms that the patient may get during the next visit or these are potential drugs that you should, you should uh, think about. Again, it's, it's a case of human uh, along with the tool rather than the tool replacing the human, like people mostly view it as. Exactly, right? It is 100% augmentation. 
Um, and doctors use this because it's how they currently do it. So if you look at um, any type of diagnosis that a doctor would do, it's usually not uh, super precise and deterministic like this. It's called differential diagnosis. They'll come up with three or four plausible explanations to what's happening to you, and then they'll further test those. So even doctor, the best doctors themselves, it's not like an immediate uh, conclusion, right? So the models that we develop, they, they work the same way. Instead of suggesting just one, we suggest three or four plausible areas uh, with some interpretability, which we can talk about. Um, but then going off of that, now the doctor has some direction. Uh, maybe it, maybe it uh, agrees with their initial thought. Maybe it doesn't. But if it doesn't, then they'll look back and, and, and look at why the model predicted a certain outcome, right? Uh, pretty much every single thing that I developed with health and NLP, if there was no interpretability piece, it, it wasn't going to be used. Um, you know, even if I had a, an amazing performing model and let's say I had a super interpretable model that was, uh, you know, 10% uh, lower precision or something, always the lower model if, if I, if, if it can provide some kind of evidence. So evidence-based uh, modeling is tops any kind of performance uh, research in health, uh, but certainly in production as well. It's, uh, it was a no brainer to have that. Everything that we had, the way we thought about the problems, the, the methodologies we used, um, the constraints we put, you know, like uh, log odds methods or uh, non-negative matrices, we needed to have these things in place so that we can create the interpretability um, so that the actual end users can, can, can refer back to it. So that was very important. Um, I'll give you a few more examples of uh, the different types of research areas that I focused on. Um, by the way, I, I worked with uh, uh, Professor Jimeng. So he's, he's at Georgia Tech right now. He's, uh, he's one of the leaders in health, intersection of health and machine learning. Um, and then in the tail end, I got to work off of research of uh, Suchi Saria, who, who's at Hopkins now. Uh, and then she came from Daphne Collar. So uh, I feel any, all the professors that we have, you can trace back and you, it'll go back to sort of the, the foundational leaders in ML, right? So um, yeah, so I had, I had a great time there. The other research areas, uh, you know, now we're starting to get into the space where uh, not just embeddings, but now we have the idea of contextual embeddings. Uh, so using that for tasks like NER, but then it doesn't end there in this intersection, right? So normally NER, you'll pick up the entities, but then why is that useful for health? The two, two use cases. So one of them is, you know, you and I are healthy, but let's say uh, a cancer patient, for example, they're generating thousands of pages of documents per year. And a, a doctor or a nurse practitioner physically doesn't have the time to go through all that. So using NER, we can sort of pull out the key events that are taking place, put it on a timeline, and create a nice profile. So that was one use case. Uh, I think the uh, very cool use case that came out of that is there's so much of medicine that's still not well understood. You know, so when you take a drug and you see the symptoms, those are not all the symptoms that you're going to get. Those are the popular symptoms that the, the, the trial, the clinical trial came out to. But everybody's different. You know, everybody's uh, genomics are different. Uh, and using NER, we're able to start discovering patterns like uh, relationships, like, you know, disease A causes symptom B, or medication X causes symptom Y, things that are not explicitly there. But as a result of people's uh, clinical data, we can start creating these uh, graphs and these ontologies from these relationships. And it all starts with NER to extract the right, uh, right uh, entities. So I think that's a, that, was a, that was a really cool use case. Um, and then we started getting into uh, sort of the multimodal space, which leads into sort of the work I focused on later at, at Apple and then uh, Citizen, which is a startup. But any, any uh, I guess, health application that's used in industry, it's not one source of data. It ha they have to account for everything, right? Even, even all these apps that you look at where they're trying to predict um, you know, what kind of skin condition do you have from the image of a rash? That's yeah. a great demo, but if for an actual product, there's no way they can use that. You have to account for the person's demographics, their history, their family history. You need all these puzzle pieces before you can start uh, saying what, kind, what, what do they have, right? So uh, I started working with a lot of multimodal data. So this includes text, a uh, lot of text, right? And a lot of it's unstructured, clinical notes. Uh, this includes also structured text from EHR systems, uh, images. I think when people think of health and ML, people think of images, right? You know, being able to scan x-rays and stuff, but that's just one source of data. 
uh, we have time series from, uh, uh, from IoT devices, from smart devices, from uh, IoT within the actual ICUs, things like that. So and it's... I guess like yeah. this, this really surprises people that why would you need so much? But uh, people miss out on the fact that when you sit next to an experienced doctor who has done all of that one-shot learning through the mm -hmm. natural brain, yeah. Yeah. and they look at you literally sitting next to you, and uh, all of this is essentially the data that's already embedded in their brain in some sort that you need to surrogate. That's exactly right, right? So uh, one, I like that one-shot learning, right? So that, that's exactly what they're doing. The power of this is you're able to use, uh, you know, and depending on your data set, thousand to 10,000 worth of doctor's information put together. So now you've augmented one doctor with the knowledge of, of many doctors, which is, which is amazing. Uh, and it doesn't stop there. It's a feedback loop. So it keeps growing, right? Um, so uh, I think, yeah, sort of tail end is sort of working with multimodal data. And then one thing I do have to mention, uh, within health, it's not just deep neural nets that are uh, making waves and are being used. I would say the biggest uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, you know, st statistically motivated techniques are Gaussian processes, so counterfactual Gaussian processes. And I started uh, guide, uh, delving into this towards the end of uh, my master's degree, uh, mostly for uh, interpretability uh, reasons but also because it's what happens in, in the real world setting. So I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, let's say you, you, you give a patient certain medications and you develop a model based on the medications the patient, patient will have onset of symptom X at some time. Now, in, you, have a train, you have your train set and you train your model on that. Now, during the actual real life time when the model is deployed, if the dosage of the medication differs, and the time between the dosage differs, your supervised model is not going to generalize well, right? So uh, you need to be able to be insensitive to the actions and the, pol the action policies that, that are happening during that. So uh, this is when I started getting into counterfactual Gaussian processes, being insensitive to the action policy and still being able to predict what's going to happen. Uh, and it, it's, it's often referred to as the what if tool. So what if analysis. And this is, this is so invaluable to doctors because things, different things happen all the time. And, and if, uh, and you know, for a supervised model, if your input data during inference is not within the realm of your training data, you can't depend on it, right? So uh, I think there's a lot of focus switching now into not just deep, throwing deep neural nets, but uh, using more of these uh, sort of, I call it deliberate methods to sort of incorporate what we already know uh, with some of the uh, statistical methods to come up with uh, really cool uh, results like this. So that's sort of the research. Um, I think uh, I'll, and I'll conclude the research part with talking about how we actually started using this in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think first thing I learned is uh, not to predict. So I would look at a data set that we had, private or public, and I learned not to predict something just because it's cool, you know, uh, I may think it's cool and I'd, get, I'd spend you know, weeks doing something, but it's useless if you don't go all the way end to end in the very beginning. You need to figure out what, is, what are you trying to solve? Who's gonna use it? How are they gonna use it? Uh, is machine learning even needed, right? Uh, and a lot of times it's no. Um, uh, once you realize that it is something that you need, then you need to think about the data, think about how it's gonna be used, all the different component interpretability, things like that that you need. And the more decision your algorithm makes uh, for it, when you're deployed to industry, the more evidence it has to provide. So the more confident you are, the more deterministic you are, the more resolute you are, the more evidence you have to provide. So uh, that's, that's pretty much what all my uh, research focused on. Now this has nothing to do with what I did at Apple, uh, uh, but it has everything to do with what I did at the startup after that. So I think I learned a lot being in this intersection because it forced me to focus on things like interpretability, focus on evidence. And I, I actually tell a lot of research to, research, researchers to do this because everyone looks at a, like a niche ML application in a separate field and they immediately dismiss it because it's not relevant to them. But yeah. I, one thing that I do, uh, sort of this explore, exploit, I always like to read papers on niche papers on different industries because there's so many techniques you can get because they have different constraints that could be analogous to yours. Uh, and that, that's kind of what innovation is, if you think about it. It's sort of taking things from different industries, right, and applying it to your unique industry. And uh, I, think, I think that's the best thing I got out of working in this space, uh, working with these constraints. So, yeah, I had a great time uh, doing that. And um, 
I, I actually did think about doing a PhD after, after that as well. Uh, but then I had, uh, which we can talk about next, but then I, I started this thing called Hotspot, uh, which sort of uh, took me on a different path. Uh, PhD is still on my mind, but uh, not sure <laughs> these days. <laughs> I think before we talk about Hotspot, uh, one yeah. thing that I've learned is uh, during your school days, your university days for my friends in India, but uh, during your school days, you were really driven by your interests, so to speak, mm -hmm. because uh, even then you were at the cutting edge, we're talking about interpretability, you've authored, uh, I think, a post with O'Reilly on this. Mm -hmm. And that was ahead of this time, and that was completely curiosity driven. Someone might come in today, they'd be like, okay, PyTorch has capped them. That means interpretability, interpretability is up and coming, uh -huh. but that, that's not really the case, right? If, if you're just following the trend, that wouldn't take you anywhere, especially with machine learning, just because how fast the field moves. Yeah, that's a great point, Sanyam. If you're reading it, the same thing as everybody else, you're going to be thinking the same way as everybody else, right? So to think out of the box, you have, you have to stretch. You have to go explore the things that people aren't looking at. Um, it, it's good to stay on top of the trends. Absolutely do that. But... You, Set a, set a time for that, set a certain amount of time, and then make sure you set a certain amount of time for your personal interests and then niche areas to focus on. Um, I, we'll talk more about that later, but yeah, I think it needs to, there needs to be a balance there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, now, now coming to what led you to finding your, uh, so to speak, your business idea that you really wanted to go ahead and start this startup called yeah. Hotspot, <laughs> the story behind it. Yeah, well, it was kind of a little bit of a forcing function. Uh, I learned a lot from it, but um, so uh, I'll start with a little bit of background. Uh, so I think it was, so I'd started my master's. Uh, so I was at Hopkins for three years and then the master's was just one year. And I really wanted to focus uh, on computer science during my master's. Even though it machine learning focused, I didn't have a great computer science background. I think I took Q basic in high school uh, and I didn't, uh, it, it wasn't the best experience. So I, I said, computer science is not for me. Uh, my dad was a computer scientist. I'm not going to follow him. Uh, but then now, uh, all it takes is one good teacher. And I had a great teacher who, who taught uh, Python and I loved it. Uh, so I started digging into it and I wanted to get really good at, uh, core software principles at Georgia tech while still learning machine learning. So in September we had this hackathon. Uh, it's actually one of the biggest hackathons in the country, uh, in America. And it's called, uh, hack GT. And it's, I would say 90, 97, 99% computer scientists. They're, they come in, uh, you know, they, they're phenomenal computer scientists, front end, back end, a lot of them are full stack, they do everything. And- Was this uh, the one that you finished second in? Uh, is, is yes, this the one? So, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I was one of the few um, non-computer science people and I was looking for a teammate. I, I, I didn't want to build it myself. It was two days. Uh, nonstop and I didn't want to build it myself because I, I couldn't I didn't know a lot any front end or anything and I kept I kept talking to people and people uh, dismissed me because I, I didn't have computer science right <laughs> no they said what do you know I said Python and these guys you know they're they're all JavaScript they know node express <laughs> like Python uh, so um, no one even heard my idea of my idea but I met another guy who's really good at front end but he's a biomedical engineer um, and the idea that we had was so this was uh, in 2012, uh, New York Taxi Limousine Commission, they released the last five years of taxi data. So for every single taxi, you know, where they went, where they stopped, how long it took, uh, who they picked up, how much was the cost, like it, literally everything. And it's still available. I think it's on Google BigQuery. So I saw this data set a couple of days before the competition. And this is when Uber and Lyft were first coming out. And I said, what if we could build something that could tell taxi drivers where to go in the big city? And uh, I had this idea because, uh, I, I, you know, Hopkins is in Baltimore. There's this concept of surge pricing. I don't know if Ola Cabs has this too, right? So when there's a lot of people it's in everywhere. a city. <laughs> it's everywhere. Oh, it's everywhere. everywhere, yeah. <laughs> when there's a lot of people in a city uh, or like an event or something, uh, there's a lot of demand. They spike up the price because to, you need to go home and you're going to pay the price, right? So yeah. I decided taxis are static. What if we can get taxis at these hot spots? Uh, before they actually occur. So then now, even though somebody would normally take an Uber, Lyft, or Ola cab, um, because it's a better experience, they'll take a taxi because it's there and it's cheaper. You know, uh, I remember to go down like, like 40 blocks, I'd pay like $50, you know, uh, taxi, like flat fee, $10, they'll take you there. So uh, we had the data now and we started building. So uh, for the actual competition, we didn't go too deep. We just used the data set that we had. 
uh, and yeah, we ended up we ended up winning second place. And we uh, there were a couple of investors in in the panel, like Georgia Tech investors, and we won uh, twenty thousand dollars for for building this. So it had a nice front end. Uh, we used uh, actually the model I used for the initial version, random forest. You know, I, I just had all the data there, and I could get I could predict with with phenomenal accuracy where a hotspot would be twenty to thirty minutes before it actually occurred. So after we got the funding, we actually decided to make this into a proper app, uh, and it, we, we we thought it would help taxi drivers because uh, there's something called a medallion. You need a medallion to drive a taxi. And the price of that was going down because of Uber and Lyft. So we said, let's develop this app. Let's get this in the hands of taxi drivers and see if they can, they can really benefit from it. So after the competition, we started putting together not just the taxi data, but uh, Eventbrite events, right? So all the sporting events. Uh, we, we figured out patterns like uh, there are a lot of consultancy companies in major cities. And they all come in and they fly out Thursday, Thursday evening. Those are yeah. other hotspots. Weather, right? We got weather reports coming in. So we had all these uh, data from all these various resources and now our performance went even higher and, and it was, it was real time now as well. We were able to start getting this. So we developed the app um, and I was still in school during this time, but we would fly to New York on the weekends. Uh, I was in Atlanta, but we would fly to New York and we didn't ask anyone for permission or anything. We literally went to taxi drivers and we said, Hey, we made this free app, you know, uh, why, why don't you check it out and use it? So then they started using it, uh, a couple hundred initially. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we started talking to the taxi, New York Taxi Limousine Commission as well, see if we can get their buy and start uh, uh, allowing taxi drivers to use it directly on the taxis. Um, so, you know, things were going well. And I think we learned a couple things. So one, uh, just on the market itself, it was kind of a, a dying industry because uh, Uber and Lyft were getting started, but they were moving so fast, right? And they... The, all the data that they generated, they kept. So yep. literally, I guess, nine months after we, we launched, we were testing out things. They launched their own version on their app, right? And I, I actually think it's called Hotspot, to be honest. You, you should check on that. <laughs> uh, very similar, Hotspot, singular. So uh, it's different. But they had their own version. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of taxi drivers were losing money. Uh, they were sort of uh, moving becoming Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. So we're sort of serving a dying industry. And I think the biggest thing, I, I learned two things. The good thing I learned is I love building something with a small team and moving fast. Uh, and I actually wanna talk about something that you've done as well, but I love doing that. And then I realized um, when you are building something, this, not everyone has to follow this, but for me, I think it's true. I said, anything I build after this, it's something that I wanna use. It's a lot of fun in the beginning when you're building something for somebody else and you see the joy in their face, but to wake up months later and continue to have that same passion and drive, it really needs to be something that you use, you, that you're constantly testing uh, and that you understand the user, right? Or you are the user. So that wasn't the case in this one. And I sort of followed because, you know, because we won this at Georgia Tech, because we got the funding, I wanted to try it out and see how it was. So it was a great experience, but I don't think it was the right market or right product. Uh, but uh, I learned quite a lot. Uh, the team grew a little bit bigger after that, actually. And uh, yeah, we ran for about nine months. And then from there, uh, that led me to come into uh, Apple after that and started the industry work at that point. But um, yeah, but actually, I, I was curious about you, Sanyam. Uh, you had actually started something as well, right? Uh, Neuro Instant. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yes. yeah, I just want to very quickly hear about your experience with that and, uh, you know, some of the things that you learned from that. So. That, that it's, it's kind of funny that the reason that started was uh, no one actually teaches about us about tax in, in school, yeah. funnily, as, as much as it's important. But none of the real world stuff is tax. It's good. <laughs> I could go on for hours about that. But uh, so yeah. I wanted a job in college because I wanted experience in machine learning. Mm -hmm. So I've hacked my way into uh, freelancing because that's one way you can work and get experience because I just wanted a taste of the field. Fast forward. I realize if you start, a, if you register as a startup in India, mm -hmm. you get tax holiday for three three years. So that that led me to. Uh, that's pretty nice. Okay. That led me to creating Neurosense. So I was this kid in in my sophomore year, uh, earning tax free money, <laughs> living the dream, so to speak. Wow! And, very uh, nice. oh, so you started it when you were in college. I did. Yes. Uh, so I, I just wanted a taste of the field and. Uh, I kept talking to people. I, I reach out shamelessly to people like you. Hey, I'm interested. Uh, is there anything that I can work with on you? 
Uh-huh. At a point, someone offered me money, and then I realized, okay, is is this how people earn money by writing code? I I didn't know that, right? I was still in college. Yeah. After after a while, it grew to an extent that I asked a friend to come in. Uh, we started working together, just the two of us, and that continued until uh, the end of college when I started getting job offers. Oh wow! Okay, very nice. So my my I don't have any interesting experience. My only thing was, hey, I I want to know what's computer vision. I want to know what's NLP. I want to know what's reinforcement learning, mm-hmm. and um, I want to work for something that's in the industry. The easiest way is to go out, uh, find a freelancing gig. Don't care about the money if you're in college, which I didn't absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I, it was a great learning experience. Just the two of us, man, and I learned about okay, how do you manage deadlines? How do you communicate? I learned something that even writing emails in the right fashion is something that you need to nail. Yeah. That's not taught in school. I would like even uh, complain against the school for that. So, <laughs> all of those job things I got got in early. So my my advice to like anyone in school is if if you pretty much free in the evenings, apart from taking books, try to do some projects with people who'd pay for it. Yeah, I think you discovered the best way to learn. Right, make something big as you can. Make something solid. And use that as as your channel to learn more, and uh, yeah, and if you can make money off of it, that that that'll keep your uh, sort of runway keep going to keep going, right, and keep learning. So, oh, that's awesome. Okay, I didn't I didn't know that. Was the... <laughs> so it's not an interesting story. It's just just something that happened out of pure luck for me, luckily. Oh, very nice. Okay. Now, before before I ask you about your journey at Apple, uh, you mentioned this very interesting thing that I'd again like to highlight is that. and probably because i've watched a lot of shark tank that that's why i realized this but you mentioned you need to be the user but you mentioned it that you don't need to be the first user of your product you need to use the product to understand but it shouldn't be a market that only you would be excited about that's why you mentioned that it's a product that you'd like to continue using it after you've created it and not the case of it's just something that only you and only you want and that that's yeah. also important for people to exactly. realize i think yeah i think a lot of people get motivated initially let's say you make something and it has some traction but you don't really care about it you don't care about the market or the users they're sort of infatuated with the potential for money or or fame or whatever it is right but then yeah. it really boils down and and you're grinding for something that you actually don't care about you're not you're not going to put in the effort at, at, after a year or two years so i think it's important to be honest with yourself from day one you know is this something that you truly care about because you want to give you want to put in 100% not just now when the when the money is there or when the money seems plausible for years down the line right so uh i think that's a, i think it's an important philosophy to have for anything in life right if you're going to do it uh don't do it for applause uh and you it should be something that you do where even after you finish doing it and there's nobody behind you there's no follower nothing but you're happy you did it that's a win right so i i think that's uh that's a that's a good perspective to have on like do something where you don't care if anybody follows you but you yourself are happy that you did it yeah and i i guess we lucky in the tech world uh, if we end up creating a product you've actually learned something so to speak you've actually gained some experience even if you haven't gained money so to speak out of the product oh absolutely i uh, i'm going to talk about this later but uh i'm kind of on a break right now and these last 6 months Uh, nothing against the companies I've been at before. I, I've learned more technical product and sort of business thinking than I did last three years. You know, just being able to go at my own pace. So, if people are thinking about doing startups or working on side projects on top of work, it's never going to be wasted time. Even if nobody sees it or if it, you know, doesn't go anywhere, you're gonna, like you said, you learn so much, and that's uh, that self growth is invaluable, right? Because the next thing you make is going to be faster and better. So. Uh, yeah i think absolutely totally yeah. now, now coming to your journey at apple what all did you work on and can we still ping you for discounts on iphone <laughs> can we be the annoying uh, friend i actually don't get discounts uh i think so my whole family and this is still the case everybody had at least one or two generations higher of iphone than i did uh, <laughs> because they were working at apple Yeah, while I was working it up, you know, so I had I get the office device, but my personal always one or two generations behind, and it's it's still the case. So I think yeah, they they use that well. Um, actually, when I, I remember when I tell when I told my family I'm working there, it's the first thing everybody asks. Uh, so <laughs> uh, yeah, I had I had a great time at them. I I was there for uh, almost three years, and I I did a lot of things. Um, I guess to, to broadly put it, I did uh, I revamped a lot of the rule based systems. 
that were uh, uh, contingent on NLP inputs to deep learning based. And um, I'm sorry, uh, for the audience, I'd like to highlight again, we, we were earlier talking about embeddings and now we're talking about this stuff. Uh, Goku yeah. has been in the field since 2012 and TensorFlow came around right around 2015. And it's, it, it wasn't all that easy. You can't just copy paste from a tutorial during those days like you can now. Yeah, no, that, that's true. It's getting, it's getting better now. Or it's much better now, right? But yeah, I remember back then, maybe there were two or three blogs that we could look at, right? And, and, and it was basic examples. If you want to go on your own, you have to like kind of tinker around. Uh, now there's, now there's like, I saw yesterday implementation for PC grad TensorFlow PyTorch coming out soon. Now it's like super specific things. Implementation is already available. So it's, yeah. been, it, what it's, it's been three, four years. The industry has just uh, grown like crazy, but, um, but yeah, so that I did uh, mostly NLP at Apple. Uh, I'd say even though uh, quote unquote research researcher, uh, there's two, there's two kinds of research at Apple actually. Um, you have the hardcore research teams, which are usually computer vision. Um, and then if they're going to be using some kind of time series inputs, but, uh, the hardcore research teams are solely focused on research. And I, you may remember this when Apple put out its first paper for the, uh, one of the ML conferences, I, I, I think it was yes. ICLR. I can't remember exactly, but it was, I was there at that time. That's when they realized, okay, well, we need to get PhD students to come to Apple. Otherwise we're not going to really innovate. So how do we get PhD students? We have to, we have to actually give back to the community, right? So uh, they started, you know, getting into the conference scene. Uh, I actually remember that I went to one intern presentation and I met uh, uh, Thomas Kiff, the graph neural net guy. I remember seeing him, his presentation. And I said, uh, I asked him, you know, like, you know, how many years are you into PhD? He was like one or two or something. It's amazing work then. And then I saw his thesis a couple of days ago it's like a book, right? He's got like yeah. 10 uh, innovations with his team. He's a great guy, but that, that is sort of the hardcore research side of Apple. And I think that side is, is growing like crazy, especially after uh, Ian Ganfellow uh, um, and uh, uh, John D'Andrea, the, the research side is growing. I was more on the applied research side. So we would, we would do a little bit of research ourselves, but mostly we would leverage the research that's out there in the community and then actually start putting things into production. Um, so uh, this mostly is, you know, areas of NLP, computer vision, time series, financial data, things like that. And I think the, to summarize my work, uh, nobody cares about the performance on the test data set or your softmax values, right? <laughs> Both of those can be manipulated, uh, especially the softmax. People care about, okay, once you put something out there, Let's see how it does on some data that's coming in and then focus on the continual QA that needs to be done. And when I say QA, I don't mean traditional software sense. The, there's a big, um, big uh, sort of uh, pressure put on being able to take the data that's coming in, put it through your model, get, get that output. You need to have the feedback mechanism from day one, right? So even if you're making it version number one, you need to collect the feedback. You need to know, how well does the point that you put in, how well does it represent, uh, how well is it represented by the training set, you know? And, and sometimes companies find that out the hard way, right? Like, especially with Apple, they, they are these Twitter threads that just blow up and then they realize, okay, we have a serious problem and then something yeah, right. that's already in production. Exactly. And yeah, uh, yeah, you don't want a, a, a publicity stunt to tell you that your model is doing poorly. You need to capture that long before it ever goes out, right? So, um, uh, one of the techniques, I think this is worth mentioning, one of the techniques that we used, uh, uh, deep KNNs, right? So it doesn't matter, it's model agnostic. So with the, when you put in a data point through your model, it, it, its representation changes as it goes through the different layers, for example, if you're using deep neural net. You take that representation and you compare it with the same representation that a, a new inference point generated. And by doing this, you can start to get, at, get things like, how close is it to my training set? Was it adversarially sort of injected? Were there some injections? For example, if you see, if you see representations that are indicative of several classes instead of one, that's a clear indication that your input was manipulated, right? So we, we sort of, I, my research, the research side of things, I focused on this. And uh, I think the biggest researcher now, and they've, they've restarted their blog, is uh, Nicholas Papernot with Clever Hans. Uh, Ian Goodfellow was also there. And, and I think uh, Ian's work with not just with GANs, but with sort of adversarial training specifically, 
is another reason Apple got him as well. Um, but their, their group, if, if people are interested in being able to create robust systems uh, that can be held responsible, right? Uh, Focus on security and adversarial training. I think Nicholas Papernot's lab is, is phenomenal. So I use, we use a lot of their work uh, to sort of create these kind of systems. But uh, that's pretty much what I did. And since I was in the intersection of research, applied applied research, I, I worked with fantastic PhD, you know, machine learning folks. Um, by the way, you don't uh, need a PhD to do PhD level work. At, at, yeah. I want to reiterate that we had fantastic undergrads. We had fantastic master students. If you can, uh, I think if you can prove that you're someone who can think uh, logically about a problem, and if you have a little bit of a portfolio, uh, I think that's enough to start the conversation and, and really prove yourself. You, you don't need to have gone to a, a top tier university, spend six, seven years. It doesn't hurt, but uh, you don't need that anymore. I think that's changed, right? Or the record, you don't hold a bachelor's in computer science or self either. So. Exactly. Exactly. And, and now, uh, Sanyam, I, I even have friends who don't have bachelor's, period. You know, they, after high school, they, they did some projects. Uh, you spent a year or two. And I think these companies, I think Google, Google started this now, too, a couple of years ago. The bachelor's is no longer required, right? Yeah. If, if you're someone who's motivated, dedicated, and you, and you can show it with your portfolio, that's all they need. Because, uh, you know, that, that's, that's indicative of what the work that you're going to do. So you don't need to... Uh, have gone to school or spent a lot of money to go spend years at school. So that, that, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I worked with not just ML folks, but uh, product managers, uh, worked with front end people, back end people, security. Uh, so that I think being able to work with a full team, take research, put something together that actually scales and has that feedback loop, and then work with the rest of the team that can actually put it in people's hands. Uh, it seems, Every year that I was at Apple, I was amazed that things actually got launched because there were so many things that go in. There's one or a small team could never do this. I think it really does take a big team uh, of all of rock stars to put something like all the products that they're, they're releasing. So uh, I, I, I was also lucky because I started at Apple when machine learning was uh, just starting to become, uh, uh, you know, on Facebook and, and Google, it was already a big deal. Right. So I, I got kind of lucky. So I got to work with some pretty cool researchers. Uh, but now I think ML is just baked into all the different facets of Apple uh, technology. And there, I, I remember every single thing that we developed, they, we always had a privacy person in the room, a regulatory person in the room. Uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't an afterthought. It was baked into the product from day one. So that's something uh, I really enjoyed. And um, another two quick things about Apple. I was also part of Apple University. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, there's uh, he's a philosopher, but his name is Josh Cohen. He used to be a Stanford professor, an MIT professor. He invited me to be part of this group of 30 people at Apple from different groups. Um, Carlos Question from Turio is one of them, uh, Tom Gruber of Siri. And we got to sit in a room uh, and, we, and the other side of the room would be regulatory people, uh, Apple News people, uh, pretty much people from different teams. And we talked about how can AI play a role in your team and how do you think about it properly? So I think I just had, I had a great time at Apple. Uh, and I think a lot of people asked me, you know, why I left and it came down to what I really wanted to do. So when I was at Apple, the head of Apple health, uh, his name is Anil Sethi. He's, he's one of my mentors. He, uh, he's the guy who came into Apple uh, through health records. He had a company, he, Apple, Apple acquired it, uh, which became Apple Health Records. And then he, he was the head of Apple Health and his younger sister ended up passing uh, from breast cancer. And, uh, you know, it was, long story short, it was sort of a, a mishap that happened. And he decided to leave and focus, you know, he, he worked all his life, he's made a lot of money, he went to Apple, but he decided to leave to get back into the grind because he felt there was a, a lapse. So uh, I think this is a piece of advice I would offer to everyone. The moment you start to feel a little bit comfortable at your workplace because things are going well, uh, maybe you're not learning as much as you used to, uh, and it, it's time to test yourself. Doesn't matter what age you are, you need to get, get to the next phase. So uh, I decided to take that leap. Uh, I joined his company, which is called Citizen. And I also joined because uh, I wanted to bring back all the health work I did, uh, you know, back with ML. So I, I was kind of excited. And the industry has changed from my research period 
2015 to now 2018, things are actually getting deployed. And we see more and more companies <laughs> using ML. Well. And I'm not sure how it is in India, but uh, data uh, access for the individual is such a, so many hurdles to get your own data. Um, so things, you know, government regulation, the policies were starting to change. Um, so I joined his team uh, and uh, it's just a fantastic team, but long story short, you know, for cancer patients, they have a lot of data. We take their data, we generate the profile, which then the doctor uses to actually prescribe the next set of treatments uh, instead of making mistakes manually going through all, all of that, all of that information. So uh, that's what I did. Um, and then uh, if you want, we can get into the transition from citizen to what I'm doing now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, but b before that, uh, so this, yeah. this is one question that I feel everyone is curious about is what is research was, uh, because you, you've worked across all of these uh, questions or areas, what is research versus what is industrial research versus applied research? Because I, I think you can answer all of these three. Yeah. Wait, oh, that's how do you differentiate between these? Yeah, no, that's a good question, actually. Um, so I think you, you need to think about so for each of these, actually, do you mind if we break it down into, let's just do pure research versus sort of applied research. Sure. Uh, and the boundaries do blur uh, for, for the record, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so I think the first, for pure re research, you really need to think about what your goals are. So if you're in a lab that's doing cutting edge work, you know, on, on the, all the trending stuff, and your goal is to put out papers, Right, and for, unfortunately for a lot of universities, that is the goal, putting out papers and getting the most accepted. So they, they turn out papers. Um, and I think people are trying to change that system a little bit, but for now, if you're in a pure research, you know, focus on that. Uh, and I think you need to pretty much continue to uh, take what's all, keep on, keep on top of all the trending work that, that's happening and focus on putting out papers. But the advice I would give to them is, you know, continue to look at other industries and continue to focus on the specific niche you're interested in, you know, so don't always focus on getting soda out, right? So state of the art is great, but uh, you don't need to do that every time, right? So don't stretch papers to try to get to that. Um, and, and then uh, I would also focus on, you know, get learning from other industries, but traditional research, that would be my advice. You know, try to, try to focus on what your lab is focusing on, uh, try to stay on top of everything. Don't always have to get to soda and focus on a niche because when you get out of the PhD setting, when you're finished with your PhD, whether you're going to industry or doing your own research, you want to have a niche behind you because that's what your life's work is going to be based on, right? You're, you're not always going to be creating this cutting edge stuff. There's a lot of people in the world, there'll be something else that'll be cutting edge, but your specific influence will be applied to something. So I feel in a way, every researcher gets, becomes applied in a certain way, whether that's after graduation or when you're teaching yourself or something like that. Um, uh, for applied researchers, I think I have a, a bit of, uh, more sound advice because I, I was in that category. I think you spend a lot of time as an applied researcher thinking about what the problem actually is that you're trying to solve. And you think about, I think this is what I do. First thing, uh, when you're given a problem, whether you're in industry or you're in a more applied research startup or something, you're given a problem, Think about the solution with your team with zero constraints, right? So it could be the most absurd solution at first, but think about everything, all the best solution possible with zero constraints. Once you do that, then you need to start factoring in the constraints, look at all the current technologies that you may have, uh, and then think about, start devising solutions. So when you're doing this, you automatically ask the question, is ML needed, right? And if you're at an industry where ML is not needed and you're given a problem, you, you can't always say, I don't want to work on this because it doesn't have ML, right? Uh, you know, especially if your title is not ML engineer or something. If you're a traditional software engineer who knows ML, if ML is not needed, you still need to solve the task, right? So as an applied researcher, you, you're still going to be held responsible for that. But yeah, I, I think to, to summarize it, a, a lot of the focus on applied research is thinking about the problem, whereas for research, and there's no, nothing wrong with this, but whereas for research, it's about performing really well on a specific data set. Uh, but my advice is, you know, keep doing that, but then make sure you have a focus to all the work that you're doing, you know, uh, at least having some kind of targeted purpose. So when you leave, it's not like you just applied, uh, you know, a bunch of models to a bunch of data sets and you have soda performances. 
because that's not a, that's not a portfolio. A portfolio is you 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 had a purpose behind all your work, right? You, it's targeted, so that could be specific or general as you need it to be. But um, that that would be. I think that's how I would differentiate between these two. And that will also allow me to segue into another thing I wanted to touch upon. You're also a mentor at Sharpest Mind, and I believe uh, I, I read somewhere that you were also involved in hiring at some points of your career. So yeah, I, yeah. To, yeah. Oh man, I, I think we can talk about. How, uh, so I'm actually talking to uh, Jeremy tomorrow uh, okay. for the yeah for the uh, Towards Data Science podcast. So uh, I think we can talk about this for hours, Simon. But I'll try to summarize. First, I think if you're looking for a job. Uh, and you have little experience or a lot of experience, join Sharpest Minds because they've got mentors at all different levels, right? Uh, and I think, I, I think now at Sharpest Minds, mentees have become mentors. And I remember a tweet from Russell a couple of weeks ago. He said he's become a grand mentor, right? So <laughs> I think they've got a, a, a great model and a model that actually focuses on your growth, right? They, uh, they've they've clearly aligned the incentives. Uh, uh, they've, they've done a phenomenal job. So um, in terms of hiring, I, I think I've, 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 I've hired myself. I've been in interviews myself as well. And I think I, I have a couple different advices. Everybody takes Coursera. You know, everybody does cattle competitions. Maybe not a uh, you know, uh, level as you, Sanyam, but people have uh, these things in, in their uh, resume, Fast AI. These are all like fantastic things to have on your resume. But then the, I feel the industry has gotten so saturated now that that's not enough. You need to, you need to make something with all the stuff that you've taken, right? Uh, and it's more so the case now than ever before. So you need to differentiate yourself and you need to show that the work that you've been working on is going to be useful for the bottom line of the company that you're trying to get hired at. Right. So uh, not not to bash on on specific things, but let's say you're you have you're making some uh, model modeling on some toy data sets or something and you make a project out of that. That's great to learn. But then when you're actually applying for a job that no one's going to look at that, you know, uh, especially if it's a, you know, like a tit- I think Jeremy always talks about a Titanic data set or something. Right. Or MNIST. Uh, you don't want to do that stuff. So I think my advice would be uh, pick. Initially learn a lot of stuff, work on projects. Seriously, just re-implement things that are already out there because that's how you learn. But then when it comes to your portfolio, you, you don't want to put that stuff in there because the, whether it's hiring manager or recruiter, they have limited attention, they have limited time. You want to put the, the top two or three amazing projects that you've worked on. And these projects have to be super niche. I keep coming back to the niche, but they have to be specific to what you're trying to apply to. And they have to be unique and they have to, they have to really uh, wow the person that's reading it. So a lot of different strategies there. And I think um, Shopper's Minds right now, they're, they're really focused on getting people to work on projects. And um, that's actually one of my goals with Made With ML as well. Uh, with all these resources out there, let's put it together. And then now let's get people to work on the project. So I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest way to differentiate yourself with hiring. Unfortunately, uh, not sure how it is in other countries, but even when you have all that stuff, it's not enough because there's still so much noise, uh, which is when I think uh, companies like Sharpest Minds really comes into play because to get it in front of somebody's eyes, unfortunately, you need someone to help you get there, right? So with Sharpest Minds, we have actual people at companies who are helping people out, which is phenomenal. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be based on your, your talent and what you put out. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I, I think hiring industry as a whole needs to change, Sanyam. It's uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with applicant tracking systems. They, I, I mean, we use this at, at, at large companies. They literally take a resume and they look for keywords. For example, if you don't have Stanford, you didn't go to Stanford, MIT, top tier university, or if you didn't work at Google or something, you're immediately tossed out, right? right? So. You know, if you don't have the, let's say you, you, you didn't have the money to go to a top tier college or you weren't at the right place to go work at a top tier company before, you can, how can you get your first foot in the door, right? So I think the whole hiring system is flawed. There's, there are a lot of things that need to change. I would say the biggest flaw is when the recruiter, nothing against recruiters, but when a non-technical person looks at your technical resume to assess how technically adept you are for a technical role, that's a huge disconnect. You know, the, the person who actually 
the job? Should we be looking at it? <laughs> that, that's also where people start to reverse engineer, right? Like, yeah. for example, yeah. students, they join Google Students Club, which uh, mm-hmm. nothing against it, but isn't equivalent as working at Google, but that'll get through the filter system, like you said. And people will throw all of the keywords on a toy project. For example, I did sentiment classification using transformer architecture. And what they would yeah. have honestly done is just use used hugging face tutorial <laughs> on some data set. But exactly. it, it looks good on the resume, right? And yeah, that's, that's where people start to add to the noise. Yes, exactly right. People are optimizing for the wrong thing. So um, in terms of the actual project to type, types of projects to work on, I think Shopper's Minds also re- uh, refers to as the healthy veggies, right? So yes. I would say when you're working on a product, uh, on a project, um, you need to show first, because it's niche, you have to show some industry knowledge. So let's say you're going into a health group or a fashion group, show some knowledge that you know the industry and that that for example the ways you can do that use the data set from the industry if it's public that's great if you have to scrape your own even if it's small that shows one that you can you know how to scrape data you know you go get her attitude but you know how to work with data that's in this industry perfect that's that that's good to have and then you can show your ml skills you know the modeling and show show this responsibly don't show you know uh transformers up for tech sentiment first first <laughs> thing right start with something super simple that well, you know, that's 70 years old, you know, show logistic regression, then slowly build up as you would in the actual job. And, and all my industry jobs, we never started with state of the art stuff. We always started with simple stuff, set the baseline, plot it, monitor it, and then add your stuff, right? Incrementally show that improvement. So do I that. For, for the people who haven't worked in machine learning, you try telling your manager, you'll take 10, 15 days to implement the task of architecture. Good, good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, definitely show the incremental. Um, and then I think now, Sanyam, I think this is a lot in the last year. So when I was applying for jobs and stuff, it was good enough to stop here, you know, show the data set, show the web scraping, do the modeling, show the experiment. Perfect. Hired. Uh, now you have to go one step above. And I think this it's, it's becoming, I see it more and more, which is good. And I see it on made with ML as well, but you need to have, uh, some kind of product demo. And it doesn't have to be like a live thing. It could be a write-up, right? Simple as a write-up. Uh, but it's even better if you can have like a, a Heroku app or now Streamlit, right? Streamlit's phenomenal. If you can, if you can showcase your product, even if it's tailor-made, three, four sample inputs, that's okay. It doesn't have to be a custom input. That the ability to showcase that shows so many things. Um, one, you're actually able to put something together end to end, which is very valuable, especially if you're going to a startup. Uh, and then it also shows your communication skills. You know, you don't just, you're, you don't just stop after the, the tech, the, the math and the modeling, right? You're able to show how does this actually fit for this industry? How do I, you know, how do you interpret the outputs? What does that mean? Uh, I think that's, that's very important, the communication skills aspect, because you need that in, in the job that you're going into. So I think if you put, if you work on projects that have all these different components uh, and then showcase that, I think, uh, that you've at least done your part in terms of how you can prepare. And then I think you have to uh, leave it to sort of groups like Sharpest Minds. And there's a lot of other groups who are pushing talent purely based on the talent itself, not because of who you are or where you're from, right? If you have great work, we're gonna try to get you in the right, front of the right people based on that. Um, but that'll change. But while you're waiting for that, best advice for getting jobs, uh, Sharpest Minds also has said this before, cold call people like cold email people on LinkedIn. Don't bombard them. Find a very specific area you're truly interested in. Find the contact person. They don't have to be the hiring manager. Actually, it's better if they're not a recruiter either. Contact like the actual engineers, right? Start a conversation, have a chat with them. Uh, just talk to them about your work. You know, don't, uh, don't go in saying, Hey, I want a job, you know, say, Hey, I've been working on this. I see your company's interested in this. I'd love to talk about it and share my work. I think that's how it starts. You can start doing that. I, I think that's very successful. Um, and Sanya, I, I, one thing I've been thinking about recently, uh, I'd say about 20 to 25% of my friends uh, in, in California have been laid off uh, during this COVID uh, period. And it's because machine learning is usually not core to their product. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an auxiliary thing that boosts the bottom line, but it wasn't core. So a lot of them were laid off. So. I think uh, this advice is going to be good for a lot of people because a lot of people are going to be looking for jobs after this. And 
it's it's changed since two or three years ago when, when we were looking for jobs you know you, you need more and more now to to actually get in but it, it's also more fun and there's more resources so um it's it yeah it's definitely doable for sure I, I guess another thing for me to highlight is like you mentioned the the veggies and this is also on your sharpest mind i think mentor profile that you teach your mentees to work on full stack projects and not yes. not just the obvious sexy part of modeling because that's that's also good to what a company does you won't just be working on creating models all, all day and night and keep yeah, yourself exactly. on this yeah so actually i i get um sorry one second so i actually get a lot of out of that so all the people that I, I'm, i'm mentoring right now uh i'll give you a rough, rough outline of what we do uh everybody comes from different industries so we actually spend quite a bit of time talking about what they what kind of problem they want to solve we i kind of force people to scrape their data sets just get familiar with beautiful soup you know just start working with these things so you know and then if there is an extra data set out there i would say use that for pre training for example right so uh one of for health for example scrape your own data set there's some public data sets that's fine and then use data sets like pubmed abstracts to train your own embeddings or something like that right uh and there's also a lot of open source embeddings now uh we can talk about hugging face later too but there's a lot of open source tools out there uh so develop that and then the modeling will work on that for another couple of weeks but then after that i i make everyone place a huge focus on experiment tracking and i think the two biggest are a lot of people love ml flow and a lot of people love weights and biases so um usually the ml flow are traditional software folks who are familiar with uh like apache frameworks things like that so they they love sticking with that and then weights and biases i think is fantastic as well so we force uh focus on exp- experiment tracking and then after that uh i teach people how to wrap everything with the rest api we used to use flask but now we use fast api i think uh fast api is, is fantastic you know they've got uh pedantic models the speed is as close to node js uh so i i started putting that into the curriculum and then after you wrapped everything into an api make a demo literally takes 10 20 minutes with streamlit right so full end to end now they have a project that they can they have a write up they can showcase they put on the resume made with a mal profile whatever it is uh but this end to end product project that's niche and it's it's really it's cool you know it's cool they're it's they're right? exactly right um so that's sort of what i've been putting together and as a result of doing this for I, over i think it's now four four different people last couple of months uh i've actually i'm putting together a video on how to do this for for everyone right so it's going to be a, a free video uh I, it's actually going to have a a tensorflow keras version and a pytorch pytorch awesome. lightning version <laughs> uh, just because i want everybody to look at it and not dismiss it so uh, it's going to be a full end to end you know from the beginning how do you look at it and i'm also going to uh, incorporating some of the things like uh, like nicolas paper knots work on how to use your outputs and things like that how to think about that and then end it with streamlit app uh, full end to end uh, the whole thing is like an hour long so i'm going to i'll probably release that in a week or two um, But yeah, I think everyone should do that. That's like the new baseline now for what your projects need to look like. Um but it's it, yeah, it, it's cool though because we get to play with it. Like today uh today's trending project I made with ML. Uh before I looked at the code because he had this uh demo, he made his own on TensorFlow JS. I I actually played with that for 10 minutes. I was playing rock paper scissors with one of his things. <laughs> so uh I think it's cool for the industry as well to be able to see all this stuff and play with it and uh, and do some uh ablation tests and things like that even even for papers to put it broadly now this is this is not applicable to all of the papers but papers that have a demo for example if you remember the declusion uh, paper from c mm-hmm. i think this year yeah, if yeah, you yeah. have a demo that that captures all of the attention compared to just just a good write up like that that's Absolutely. a theory on top of it yeah you get so much traction and publicity like your work get it's i'm not going to call it unfortunate that you have to do that because there's so much noise this is how you stand out right so uh yeah the deocclusion one was uh, amazing and i i actually i i talked to uh the first author of that paper they had released that paper and they'd spent i think uh an extra week sort of putting that that demo together and that demo website mm-hmm. and then the actual research is like a year right and it's extensions of their previous research but that one extra week like killed it for them they they got okay. great publicity they got so many people asking questions and now their paper is being used for future research which is exactly their goal um so yeah absolutely take that extra effort to put that demo together um uh, research and industry it's it's worth it for both uh, both sides actually yeah 
since we're already talking about education, initially I had mentioned the three aspects that are highlighted on your profile, AI research, healthcare. Yeah. Now coming to education, mm-hmm. what led you to transitioning into made with machine learning? Uh, how did it start? And now I, I really try to understand the platform. It's not Twitter, it's not product and it's not Reddit. <laughs> What is it exactly? If, well, it's if a little bit like Sonic, but, but uh, okay. So actually, you want, you want me to compare it to something that already exists? I, I just want to understand what it really is, and I, I like, yeah. So what, actually, who better I, to ask I, than the founder? Sure, I have heard this. Uh, people gave me this. They said it's the product hunt focused on ML applications, um, and it's it's soon to become kind of the Spotify, which I'll talk about the feature that's coming out next week, um, but. Uh, second, it's not just ML, actually. I, I have a lot of friends in design, uh, front end, and things like that. And I'm seeing the same pattern across uh, many industries. So, so far, we have Reddit to like read information. We have Twitter to read and interact. We have Quora to answer questions. It's, it's these, I, if you think about it, those are horizontal ecosystems where yes. a specific task for many industries is done in one platform. But now, as of last year, there are vertical ecosystems where all the tasks for one industry lives in one place. So there's this new one called Designer Co. I think Dev.to, which is for like a full stack type of all 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 the things you do on all the different platforms for this one thing. So I kind of wanted to replicate that for machine learning, and it happens iteratively, right? But I wanted to make it where it doesn't have to be the resource, but a resource where kind of everything is tagged and organized so that people can come to keep on top of all the trending things and then also learn from all the past work that's being put together. Um, but just really quick about why I transitioned from uh, the startup. So I'd launched, uh, it used to be called Practical AI. Uh, I, I, had to, I, I had to actually change the name, uh, I guess two months ago now because uh, we got a lawsuit that the, the term Practical right. AI had been trademarked. So I had to change the website. I had to change uh, the repository, change the URL. But that's the story behind that. But it used to be called Practical AI. And I had released, uh, when I was working with O'Reilly, you know, I, I wrote a lot of the code uh, for my lessons and stuff like that. I had released all that code on uh, GitHub after changing it. And I did this when I started work at the startup, at Citizen. And over the next eight months, I saw it picked up a lot of traction. So a lot of uh, people started learning from it. Uh, Superficial metrics, uh, it's among the top 10 repositories, uh, uh, ML repositories, all time on GitHub. Uh, I say superficial because there are actually amazing toolkits with less than 100 stars that are absolutely amazing. Uh, but it, it was still good to see this. But the really important thing that I saw was I get emails from people, maybe one or two a month, uh, about how they used Practical AI. They took the course. But it wasn't enough. Then they took three or four more courses because I only covered the basics. But this motivated them to take the four courses and then build something. Most of them were sort of in the finance advertising space. But I remember three very distinct ones. There's, uh, there were two uh, with computer vision on the fashion side. But the coolest one was uh, with anti-poaching. Right? So uh, these researchers, uh, it was three girls in Kenya, they had used a computer vision model to basically look at slices of meat and be able to predict how much, what percentage of the meat has game meat. Game meat is uh, basically wild meat, right? So from lions, elephants, things like that. So usually what a lot of the poachers will do is they'll mix the meats together and sell it. Uh, so they were, able, they were able to do this. And normally it would take two weeks to find out if a piece of meat had game meat. It would go to Germany in a lab and come back. Uh, now they, they can use computer vision to get it done in under a minute. And now instead of waiting two weeks with, to go to the market and get the poachers, they're gone. Now they can go that afternoon to the market. And usually the sellers aren't the poachers, but they're connected to the poachers. So I got an email about this and I started thinking, poaching is something I'll never get into in my life because I'm, I'm nowhere near it. <laughs> but I got to influence somebody who's not only building things, but launched it and is now using it with, with a government thing, right? So I, 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 t- I had a chat with uh, Anil, the CEO, and I said, I'm, I'm one person in one team here and I can have a certain amount of influence for cancer patients. But uh, I want to take a break uh, for about a year and see if I can create a platform where I can influence. I think practical AI lessons were okay, but they're not the best quality. So I wanted to take some time to create a platform and eventually create my own lessons to influence even more people. Ha- have it be like a base that people can use to, for free, right? To, to use to build even more things. So I wanted to do this. I also wanted to learn some full stack development, which uh, hence made with ML. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, a, uh, that was sort of the reason to come out. Uh, and after this, I think I have a couple things in mind, um, but I'm learning so much right now, Sanyam. It's a uh, tremendous amount uh, right now. But yeah, going back to uh, what Made With ML is actually, yeah, I, I just, yeah, it's basically a place where you can discover, organize, and build and share all things ML related, right? And ML projects. Um, I guess if you want to, we can talk about the inspiration. It's kind of a, a struggle actually. So with, for example, with Sharpest Minds and other mentors, they would ask, hey, I'm from the, um, I'm from the material science field. I want to do blah, blah, blah. And I want to, do you have any resources for X? And I'd say, yeah, I do. I, I remember looking on Twitter, you know, months ago <laughs> and I go through my likes and maybe I didn't, maybe I, I didn't like it. Maybe I find it. And then I remember once, I, this, this happened like just two months ago. I was like, I, I remember Francois Cholet tweeting something. Let me go to his Twitter to find it. Yeah. Good luck. Okay. There, he tweets like every day and he, he likes so much stuff. You're not going <laughs> to find it. So I got, I got really frustrated and I decided to, I, I realized all the content that's coming, Reddit, Twitter, there's no tags, nothing's organized, right? There's no curation whatsoever. So, and it's, and it's ephemeral, right? It's great for like in the moment discovery. But I realized just with, with our timelines, right? So you, in India, 11 and a half hours or something, if I'm not awake at a certain time, I actually miss so many, even of my friends' posts, people that I follow, because I wasn't awake or I'm not online all the time. So yeah. I just didn't like that nature. And I wanted to take out the, the good stuff, the gold mines from, from these platforms. So I, I wanted it to be a place where you can add the content that you find useful, whether it's yours or somebody else's, tag it and the community curates it. So, you know, for a given topic, for a given tags, um, what is the best for this over time? So as a result, we created right now, it's two big features, the front page. Uh, I've been kind of struggling with how to name things, but I called it projects for now, but it's the trending projects, right? Today, this week, here's the top stuff by not just famous influencers in the field, but anybody, right? Uh, it, it, usually it's trending content, right? And, and people like it, but <clears throat> I've also uh, been able to share people from non top tier universities. So just last week, uh, some guy, uh, his name is Andre. He, he's from a, a, a lesser known school for great research. And he sent me a message on Twitter saying, Hey, thank you for, for sharing our work. I said, no, thank you for doing this work because people that are interested in it can now actually have a place to search for it and find it. There's no way you can do that with the ephemeral platform. So I, I I'm very grateful for that. Reddit yeah. and Twitter do allow it, but they aren't always consistent, for example. And uh, I, I was reading this somewhere, but people suggest that, hey, you should post at these timings because that's morning in a uh, Pacific yeah. uh, zone. Yeah. I, not everyone is conscious of that. And that, that's just one factor. But you may miss out on making your awesome book famous just because it didn't catch the community's eye. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. I've actually heard of that too. Uh, it's like 10 a.m. or something, right? So, um, but yeah, it's like I shouldn't have to, you know, contort my sleeping schedule to try to optimize for visibility, right? So um, that was that. And then, so we had that launch for about two weeks, that trending feature. And I had maybe close to 100 emails about how the front page is just too advanced. We had a lot of sort of beginners coming onto the platform. And even if you look on the front page now, I'd say 90% of the content is like, last week was like reformers, then synthesizers. It's like all cutting edge. And yeah. if you just look at that one piece in isolation, you're like, is this field 20 years? I mean, has this been around for such a long time because it's advanced so much, right? So what I started to do was, uh, I have a few friends. Um, not, do you know Sayak, Paul? I do, yes. Yeah, right. So people like him who give so much to the community. And then uh, he, has, he, he loves sharing great work that he sees to the community, whether it's on Twitter or I have a couple of channels with him on, on Slack as well. So people like him himself, uh, we have about 10 or uh, I guess 12 people now who constantly add content to the platform. And it's usually it's theirs and it's also other people's work. They find the trending stuff and the niche work. So they started adding this platform and I asked many of them, Hey, I know all of you have uh, kept a track of all the resources that you've liked in the past. I'm talking old resources uh, like Andre Karpati's CS231 lecture notes, yeah. Chris Ola's original blog. There's stuff that you and I use to learn this stuff, right? They're not outdated because they're foundational. 
can we get all this onto the platform to help the beginner and intermediate crowd? So we spent about a week pouring all of our saved stuff. So all of us had bad solutions. So I had mine on Chrome bookmarks, right? Just like a big shutdown of stuff. <laughs> Uh, somebody else had Trello boards. So they had like topics that just paper, paper, paper uh, under, under the boards. Other people use Google Docs. Uh, uh, some I have Apple had, Notes. <laughs> Apple Notes. Oh, there you go. Right, exactly. Right. So people took all of this and we made a, kind of an automatic way to start uploading the stuff. So now we're at almost a thousand projects down, but this is the second feature, the topics. Not just today or this week, but since the last four or five years for a given topic, we've got the best sources, right? And it's constantly updated automatically. As people add stuff, they tag it. This for this topic, the new content, if it gets uploaded, it gets changed as the best source. So we have the top tutorials, toolkits, uh, and research. Uh, we're gonna also add data sets soon, but then all the way up top, we have getting started. So these are, these are chosen by us. Like for a given topic, these are the absolute best resources. You need to, and you go through them in order. These three things, you know, it could be a video, a small uh, paper, introduction paper, and then a blog post. Go through that in order, then explore what you want. So uh, we had a lot of fun putting that together. And <laughs> if you think about it, it's not really a feature. We just put search on top of all the content that existed, right? And then we, we sort of exposed a lot of the topics. So uh, not too complicated. But um, the, the big feature that's coming out next week, which I think, which is what I've been building towards, is uh, even with Practical AI, I got a lot of emails saying, hey, uh, I wish you can show more examples in this subfield, right, in this industry. And I'm one person, and I can't scale that way. So now I wanted people to create their own curriculums and share that. So uh, I don't know if you use Spotify. I do, I do, yes. Right, so the, the magic of Spotify, and I bet you the only reason you use it is two reasons. You probably look at the top charts to get the trending music, and yeah. then you make your own playlists, right? So you have, let's say, for example, the Ed Sheeran song. You'll put it in Ed Sheeran playlist. I'll put it in my weddings playlist because he makes so many wedding songs, right? So the same piece of content, we both put it in two different collections. I'll share it with my friends who care maybe who has a wedding. You'll share it with your friends who are Ed Sheeran fans. So I'm bringing, I'm bringing the same concept into uh, Made With ML. And we're calling it collections. But being able to create not, not a big bookmark dump, but small. It could be one item, 100 items collections of playlists right? collections of yeah on, exactly <laughs> my, that you my own to, playlist of machine learning basically exactly so uh this is actually uh, not my idea but uh, sayak uh, had this idea a while ago and uh omar uh, elvis from twitter also helped me come up with this but uh i think it's going to be really cool because you can have your own curriculums for different topics you can have uh bibliography uh collections for certain projects uh a lot, a lot of people wanted to put together their own iclr 2020 playlist, right? Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure this happens to you at H2O as well. You're still at H2O, right, Sanya? I am, yes. So I'm sure this happens to you every morning, maybe on your Slack, you see like, hey, uh, you guys got to read these three papers and these two awesome ML videos. Now, I'm the just, wrong person most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the guy who's telling everyone to, to do that instead of work, right? Uh, so now, by the way, the, the playlist collections are, coll are collaborative. So you can have everyone at H2O that's ML focused all contribute their stuff every morning now and they can upload it and then people can just see, okay, I, I'm not going to read all of 10 things that Sanyam said. I'm just going to read the best one, right? Yeah. Or I'm going to read what I care about. So um, I think it's going to be very cool to, uh, when we release this, I, I thought it would take two days to make it, but it's, it's taking about a week uh, because, <laughs> cause I want it to be uh, like discovery driven. When you see a content, I want to show, these are the other collections that have that content. Or when you see the collection, here are similar collections. I wanna make the platform just jump from one thing to the next automatically. So um, that's the focus. And uh, you know, in terms of long-term vision, uh, I want this, first of all, Sanyam, 100% free. I'm uh, not going to become like the traditional uh, Silicon Valley type of founder. Um, <laughs> 100% free. Don't go free. evil on, on your users. I no, exactly, right? 100% uh, free. Always going to keep it open. Um, one thing I'm actually thinking about, which dev.to did, they actually open sourced the entire code. So mm -hmm. there are ways to hide your environment variables, which are sensitive, like my uh, Heroku code and AWS code. But the rest of the platform is completely open source. Um, and once this matures in another month or two, I'm actually going to open source the whole thing. And the beauty of what's happened with dev.to is people are contributing to the platform, like making their own features and stuff. So I, I want to do that. And I want to 
bring, I want to make the code ownership uh, community driven uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, I, I don't want to be the only one maintaining this. I want this to be just open. And two, uh, this was, a, this is a break year for me. So after, uh, it's a good point. After I leave, I don't want this to die. You know, so when, if I open source it, it runs on its own forever. Um, and I ha have people contributing to it. And I, I will continue to maintain it as well. But that's the vision with this 100% free platform, solely focused on content and the people behind it. You know, uh, you're only valued based on what you're producing, you know, not who you are or where you're from. So that's what I wanted to do uh, and sort of have it be free to break down the barriers uh, for people from all different countries, right? So being able to use that. I got some responses from people in China saying, oh, the website isn't blocked in China yet. And I said, oh, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're doing well. We got good feedback. Uh, I think uh, the way people are using it, they're using, they're checking throughout the day, kind of like product hunt. You know, yeah. you check quickly, two minutes maybe, you see all the trending stuff. That's, that's the right way to use it. You know, uh, don't be overwhelmed by all the content that you see. You don't have to read everything that's on the front page. Look at it. If there's something that interests you, Bookmark it. Eventually, you can add it to a collection soon, but organize it, right? It's triaging. Um, I think this is good advice. There's so much happening every day. If you, if you just try to read everything, you're, you're going to go insane. Um, your time is the most valuable thing. And I, I tell everybody to be the lazy, uh, lazy reader, lazy programmer. And what I mean by that is if you don't absolutely have to read this or if you don't absolutely have to build this feature or something, don't do it. Save it for later. Don't ignore it right? Save it for later, create that mental library, but then know where it is so you can come back when you need it, that you, that you do it. Um, and obviously that's the exploit, take some time to explore as well. So, you know, maybe read a little bit a day uh, on something that you actually are interested in. So that, that's my advice. I am, um, you know, going to continue this for uh, like hardcore develop, feature development for a couple more months. Uh, and then go ahead and open source this. Uh, so that's pretty much the plan. And growth has been good. We've, uh, I think every time we launch a feature, it's kind of like exponential jumps. Well, so we have around 3,000 plus users now uh, and almost 1,000 projects. Uh, and it's, it's slowly building over time. So I'm happy to see that the platform is growing. Uh, and it's, I, I don't think I deserve credit for this anymore. It's, it's driven by the community. So uh, I'm glad to be a part of it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Do you have any business model in mind at all? For example, just running ads on, on the platform or will this always be a, a community driven open source? Uh, effort? Yeah. Um, so in terms of business plan, so it, it costs me $75, I guess with the mailing, it's a hundred dollars a month, right? Which is not much at all, but I did get warning from people saying, once you cross a certain amount of users, you'll have to pay for more traffic. So mm -hmm. that's the only expense. Uh, in terms of ads, I will not be running ads that don't make sense. So I'm not going to just have random stuff. Everything that features or any sponsorships that I do, it has to be tied into, does it benefit the user? So for example, if it's the end to end thing, we need to only, I only want, will show tools that actually benefits the user, makes it easier for them to work on their products and build it. But no, we absolutely won't be dumping. It won't be an ad dump and it certainly won't be a recruiting dump either because uh, one of the things before COVID uh, came out, actually, people were using it during our beta during interviews because it has all their portfolio projects yeah. and uh, the, the hiring manager doesn't have time to read through a readme, right? So, but in the project, it's a quick snapshot. So if they're interested, they can look at the code later and stuff, but people were starting to use that. And I decided then that, that we're, it is never going to be a recruiting tool, but in period, you know, we're not going to have this free feature and then, you know, sort of take all their data and give it to recruiters to, to bombard with messages, not doing that period. Um, if we, if everything that we're doing has to directly benefit the user a hundred percent. So that's going to be the focus. Um, yeah, I, I, it's only been a month or a month and a week now. So, uh, I'm excited to see the growth and, uh, I, I think this new feature is going to be pretty interesting to play around with, uh, for sure. For sure. For me personally, it's, it's become my favorite replacement for Reddit. Uh, and my usual workflow, I'm sure many people, uh, for many people, is the same as found, find something interesting on, for example, Papers with Code or Reddit mm -hmm. or Twitter. Try to go ahead with still being overwhelmed and then start Googling those terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really where uh, Made with ML comes into picture. You can see what's trending. If you don't understand, you can go to the resources 
mm-hmm. and those will already be like community trusted so you can find the best resources to learn them and that sort of really fits into the picture and uh, talks to the need of the community right now yeah yeah exactly um i i want to hit two two points uh, a lot of you mentioned papers with code this is not a replacement with papers with code i think papers with code is absolutely fantastic and then now that they're benchmarking the soda stuff yeah. it's invaluable i mean it's i mean i use it weekly basis right uh for i think they've done a phenomenal job for research and monitoring that uh, i think now they're baked in with pytorch as well right or they're working with uh, facebook i think yes i think it's a great partnership so it's this is not a replacement for papers with code or anything like that this is uh this is more there's research on the platform but it's more for practical stuff I I don't I didn't want people to feel that when you work on something you have to make something research ready and polished to share it. That's not yeah. true. And you don't you never need a paper. You if you have a demo, you know, that's that's perfect. That's a completely different application. I wanted to have a place to share that type of stuff too. Um we do have research coming in with code as well, uh but I think if you're if you're a researcher who's trying to look at, you know, benchmarking and things like that, papers with code uh if you're trying to stay on top of anything at all all things ml related uh and now we're seeing more and more content that's not research paper i saw tim detmers he he just had a twitter uh post like a couple weeks ago yes. which had so much good stuff right he yeah. i think he said i don't have time to write a blog post that's <laughs> fine you know you don't have time for a research paper you don't have time for a blog post that's okay you still have things to say we'll we'll listen if it's good right so i think i wanted to show create a place where all mediums are welcome um and I say medium but uh, we never we will never have a paywall to block any of this stuff either right so I think that's important um but yeah no I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, you like the platform so far absolutely do now that that also brings me to another question since it's so community driven and we witnessed this across so many communities already in machine learning uh, how do you make sure that this doesn't just become another uh, stale community when chilly way it's it's not cool anymore uh, it loses traction and people don't keep coming back to it uh, do, do you see that scenario or what what are your thoughts on that yeah no that's a really good question um i i think what i'm about to say is applicable for any startup or anyone that's working with networks network platforms like this anything that you develop you, it has to fit in with what people are already doing right it has to fit with the current lifestyle and then to keep the traction going to keep keep it going you have to make what they're doing even better or more fun right so the way this fits right now people are already hunting for the trending stuff and people are sharing links on trello google docs github yeah. readme and th- there's no community around it you can't like discover one thing to another so i think by focusing on that and and putting this in between for that need we're able to get started now to keep to keep the traction going and and make it not die because it shouldn't depend on me my efforts right because that's not going to scale uh i need we're developing features that allow people to create themselves right so projects is one type of creation so if you're if someone was working on something interesting share it here so that other people can find it not today but later as well right so that's one incentive now with this collections uh if i if you read a little bit about spotify history the reason they blew up is because they allowed people to make their own collections you you become an artist yourself right yeah. uh in a way or a dj in a way so Uh, I think by creating forms of content creation like this um uh, that's how we make it sort of self sustained. And what I do is basically create these layers that organize all the stuff that people are creating. So the topics page like I said is a simple search and expose topics on top of all the projects. Now we'll have a collections page, trending collections, trending playlists, right? Uh for all the collections that people are creating. So uh it's it's very much self sustaining and I, and i always believe in building self sustaining things that way um and we're we're getting a lot of feature ideas too uh I, i i'll send you a list later to see if, if you like any of them but one of them is you know people want content creation for articles directly in here i'm sure you heard of fast pages phenomenal product people said you know i want to put my fast pages thing on made with the mouse one button and it it's possible right so um we're getting a lot of feature requests i'm trying to think about the self sustaining ones for now um but yeah i uh i i i think the only reason it would die is uh if i don't do my part right now so uh i'm working hard to add those layers for organizing everything but in terms of community traction i i don't see it dying down because 
the industry, people always talk about AI, another AI winter and stuff like that. That that's not coming. It's there's so much happening right now. Sure. And if you think there's not much happening, it's because there's so much happening in niche fields. People are actually using <laughs> different niche uh, things, right? Yeah. Things aren't super hot anymore because they're actually being used now. So uh, it's going to be phenomenal uh, for the industry. And I, I just want this to be a place that organizes all of that. So uh, my final question would be, we're still in the early days of machine, machine learning. Uh, mm -hmm. For anyone from the audience or for me, how, how can we help uh, the platform right now? Ooh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So once the collections come out, uh, you know, create your collections, share it with people. But uh, Sanya, I had people email me saying, is my project good enough to post on ML Made With ML? I, I said, I didn't even look at their email before responding. I said, yes. Okay, there's, <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, barrier to, to what level your project needs to be. You work on something that interests you and you put your creativity into it, put it on because somebody will find it interesting. And it's, they'll find it because they're, they can search for it, right? So uh, we're going to improve our search as well. But put it on because that's your portfolio and other people are going to be uh, able to find it. So um, my advice would be work on interesting things and just share that. I think that's the biggest thing the community can do, just being able to share your work. Um, and if you are someone who's interested in uh, like Sayak and there's a few other folks like Eric uh, who like sharing content, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, there's a lot of Twitter accounts that, that share con love sharing content. Uh, a lot of them are our moderators. If you are someone who likes to be a moderator, please reach out. Um, you know, we can definitely allow you to do that. And we have, we're starting to automate a lot of the data collection as well. So we have, uh, we have a Twitter bot now that was created uh, by a few of the mods. It basically looks at, for example, your Twitter circle, my Twitter circle. I have non ML people. You have non ML friends as well. But when the intersection of our circles, and do this for 20 ML folks, when the intersection of our circles start liking a lot of the same content, that's a trending ML content. So awesome. we're automatically pulling those out and they become projects after a quick review uh, within seconds. So we're getting all these things to pull out the right content from Twitter and Reddit. Uh, so it's becoming less and less manual work. And now our manual efforts are focused on finding the niche products, the niche applications that are not getting the attention because that's what we want to get onto the platform. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's going well. Uh, we'll see how, how this is in a few months. And I, I guess I, I just uh, reached to this realization. I, I was trying to find that uh, particular reason I didn't have it voted until now. And I, I'm a fan of Fast Aid and I'm really grateful to them because they foster this very warm and welcoming community. Mm -hmm. Reddit isn't exactly that. And one of the reasons is you're anonymous there. So people try to troll you. I am permanently blocked from posting in machine learning because I posted really? twice. I posted the Chai Time Data Science interviews twice and it's my content, so I'm not allowed to do that and I got blocked. The, oh, the you know, <laughs> that explains actually. I, I haven't been able to post there for a long time. I just thought my content had spam words or something, but that maybe maybe I might be blocked too. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Okay. There's, there's no way of arguing with the people. Okay, it, it, yeah. it is what it is. With Made with Machine Learning, I think it's a GitHub sign-in right now. So mm -hmm. you, you're not exactly, exactly anonymous and it's, it's a community where people are there because they want to not, not just to troll anyone. And it's, it's yeah, I, experts on the matter who are really hanging out there and yeah, exactly. uh, uploading your stuff. Yes. I think there is a place for anonymous platforms, but not for something like this, you know, because uh, there's enough toxicity in the world as it is. I wanted to make a place where if you say something, you're, you're held accountable for it. And it's okay. Like, I think people are anonymous because they're afraid to be wrong. Sometimes I wanted, it's okay to be wrong. Like you, it's okay to learn things. Right. So uh, I decided not to make it anonymous. That was an option I had. I, I wanted people to be accountable. Um, and then, but because of not making it anonymous, we have all these authors that are posting content, uh, like the de occlusion one, for example. And uh, we had somebody ask a very technical question, which is beyond my computer vision knowledge, but they asked a technical question and the author responded right there, you know? So, uh, being able to interact with the actual content creators right there. That's amazing. Uh, so yeah, definitely I'm not going to keep it anonymous and you're right. It, it does take away a lot of the, a lot of things I should, I don't have to worry about toxicity and things like that. And for, for, for the record, you can still stay anonymous with your GitHub profile, but it's, <laughs> it's a professional platform that uh, I exactly. hope you're using for the right reason. So exactly. It's, it sort of solves that problem for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Awesome. Goku, before we end the call, what would be the best platforms to follow your work if you could just name all of the platforms? Oh, okay. Uh, so definitely create your free account, uh, madewithml.com. It 
free forever. Um, you can follow. So we do day, trending posts of the day uh, on Made With ML Twitter. It's at Made With ML. And we usually share, it's usually stuff that's trending, but a lot of times it's also trending, uh, sorry, not trending stuff, really cool research by researchers, right? Niche researchers. So definitely follow us. We're also on LinkedIn, uh, Made With ML. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Goku Mohandas. Um, uh, yeah, those, those are pretty much all the social media platforms that we're using right now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Google, for joining yeah, me on the podcast and for creating the platform. Yeah, no, of course. And this was a great conversation. I definitely need more of these during COVID. <laughs> <laughs>